the, the whole goal is cash flow, right? So like yeah. the yeah. alternative would be I'll just buy a hundred and forty thousand dollar property and put twenty percent down, which would be like thirty grand or something. Right. Yeah. So if I could like do a burn, like leaving maybe only ten grand, it's mm-hmm. still like a win for me, right? So totally. like it's a it's, a, it's just like a, a cheaper or like better way to have like a, a owner rental and at the very end you've got like a this fixed up rental so it's gonna be like very low on capital expenditures or maintenance right right right, right. right, right. and as far as just like the i mean like you choose like your neighborhood or whatever like you choose where you want it to be etc you place a tenant yourself so you're not inheriting like a bad tenant like the whole yeah. process is just very conducive to like and this is the most like efficient way to like to buy properties right because, it's all Welcome to another episode of the Deals and Aloha podcast, where we talk about real estate deals, hope to leave a lasting impact on our audience, and of course, spread aloha. You can find us on all social media platforms at Komohai and Tristan. Today's guest is our friend, experienced investor, Living by coastal now. <laughs> by coastal. <laughs> the Burr man himself, <laughs> Daniel Kong. <laughs> Daniel. All right. Thanks, what's, guys. What's up, man? Good. Everything is good, man. I just stoked to um, kind of jump on the legendary podcast and with the <laughs> oh, legendary shoot. podcasters. Thank you guys for having me on. Of course, dude. Yeah. Just before we start, you have been a very, um, very inspirational part of our journey. Totally. I feel like we... Dude, actually, I still remember the first time we sat down Ala in the Moana. food court yeah. at Ala Moana Shopping yeah, Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like right off the bat, we knew that we loved your vibe. Yeah. Uh, we shared like the same energy, same passion. So it's been super neat to follow uh, the journeys, right? Mm-hmm. Both yeah. of our journeys. Because just, from that yeah. point, we've really, you know, we've grown yeah. since then. It's so cool. hundred percent. I feel like when we first started, I think like, honestly, it feels like we've been doing this for like a long time just yeah. because we've been grinding on it 24 seven. Right. But re- in reality, we've only really been kind of going at it for like a couple of years. Right. And like when we first started, we were both relatively new, right. To the, to the scene. And we we're trying to both figure a lot of things out. And so it's kind of cool to see like your friends kind of growing alongside at the same time and yeah. kind of having the same trajectory of just like some like success, like, you know, and yeah. so the same thing, I love you guys vibe, like, you know, the, the Loha vibe, you yeah. know, giving, 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 and just trying to like help the, help the community, help other investors and just like being a super, super good goal givers, you know? So yeah. Nice. And now we're doing deals together. Exactly. <laughs> doing deals together. That's what it's about. And we're going to buy 50 doors in Memphis. <laughs> we're, we're buying three commercial buildings in Kansas City, guys. So. Yeah, there you go. I love it. Nice. Well, we'll probably get into that kind of the next evolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, where our businesses are kind of taking us and mm-hmm. and where yours is specifically in yeah. Kansas but City. Let's start at the beginning. Sure. Yeah. So how did you get into real estate? So about three years ago, I read a little magic book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, yeah, which I yeah. think a lot of us start out with and it just like that book kind of like blew my mind as far as like what was possible and I think at the time I honestly was like I was never planning to buy a house in Hawaii because I just thought like housing prices were so big I mean mm-hmm. so high and it was unattainable for me at that time so I was yeah. renting I had like I was like I was relatively responsible where I had like no debt but I had like uh, maybe like 10 to 20 grand just saved in my bank account mm-hmm. and like a small 401k but nothing else other than that right so renting a little bit of like reserves for like if I need something but then nothing like never planning to have like any financial success or mm-hmm. like security like you know what I'm saying just I was I was working as a software developer making good money but I'm not like the most responsible I think person as far as spending so I make some money spend it and just enjoy my life but also like sharing with like my friends and my family yeah, too like yeah. you know and so nice but basically, I read that book and then I just like it blew my mind. And from there, I just kind of went ravenous as far as just consuming material, just trying to learn, learn, learn more. So like hundreds of hours of podcasts. I literally was reading like three or four books a week. Just trying wow. to like, I was like, wow. I was just like, I'm like a fast reader too, though. Mm-hmm. So like I'm just consuming content books and stuff. And so I just like trying to like learn more. And basically, I was like, hey, like the I actually first started tr- like trying to research stock investing but Mm -hmm. after all the books i read on that my conclusion came basically that the only responsible way to do that is with index funds and Mm -hmm. if you want to without the risk right but when i learned about real estate i found like there's like a lot of ways where you can have like very low risk with very high returns Mm -hmm. and so that was a big reason why i kind of like was going along that path and then also like the whole idea of like cash flow and like passive income you know and so nice how long ago was that that was 
the ending of 2018. So three and a half years ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. We like came in at the same time. Same time. Yeah. We were, uh, had a different avenue in, but super similar timelines. That's crazy. That's okay. Cool. So you read Rich Dad Poor, ba- Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh-huh. that life changing book, I think, mm-hmm. for all of us. And then you started doing more like YouTube University, just consuming yeah. content on your own. You didn't join a mentorship, nothing like that. And then what was that moment where you actually, like, what was your first deal? What did that look like? What was that process? Because you did you start investing in Hawaii or did you go out of state? So actually, I started out of state. Okay. And so like the big, I was like a big bigger pockets like podcast like um fan fan girl fan boy like yeah. you know, I read all of their books and stuff. Yeah. And so that really kind of like filtered or influenced like my my early like thoughts on real estate and decisions. And mm-hmm. so my whole idea was cash flow. And then you heard like this magical thing called the Burr strategy. Mm-hmm. And so at that point in time, I was like basically like just following the kind of the game plan that like um, Brandon Turner and kind of David Green was laying out. There was long distance real estate investing, the book on rental properties by Brandon Turner and stuff. And so just, that really was like my, like my goal or my mindset, you know? And Mm -hmm. so looking at Hawaii, it was just so unattainable because Hawaii on average is very hard to cash flow and the price points are so high. It just was, it was not even like a fathom, fathomable thing to own a house or buy a house here in Hawaii, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My research was just bigger pockets forums, reaching out to other investors and just reading books and, after all my conclusions, I came to like the Indianapolis market. Mm. And so okay. that was like the first thing where I tried to like pull the trigger. And actually when I was first starting, I didn't know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. So then I didn't know you couldn't borrow funds for your good down payment for like the house and all these other kinds <laughs> yeah. of things. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's all these kind of rules where, like, like lenders can or cannot do. And so mm-hmm. I know in the very beginning, I burned like this one lender. I feel so bad for them because I was like a newbie, right? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh, like I'm going to buy like this house and like try mm-hmm. to be the birth strategy, right? Yeah. And then so like, but then every time I thought you always had to start with the lender first mm. before you get the deal. So mm. then before I locked in the deal, I was like, I was analyzing like hundreds of deals where I was like, okay, this looks like a good one. So I started the process with the lender before I even had it on the contract. Oh. And then I was like, oh, like this not, I have to do diligence. It doesn't go through it. So I canceled it, right? Yeah, and I was yeah. like, oh, because I, I did it for like three or four times. You're like, then. sorry. Yeah. And I, but I didn't know, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. that's not the, because yeah. you don't know, like, and plus no. at that time, I didn't have any other investors that I was talking to. It was just like YouTube University and like yep. books, right? And so, yeah. right, yeah. right, right. And then so, the, and then the last one, it was like the, I was applying to um, buy this house. Mm-hmm. And then like the last one was like, okay, now this one was going to be the one. And, but then I, so then I had to borrow the funds from, uh, we can go to that later, but how, yeah. I, yeah. how I borrow those funds. Yeah, yeah. But then the, when I talked to lender, like you can't borrow funds for your, like your, for the, for the purchase or whatever. Yeah. So, like, so then I'm like, okay, this is it. Or like, we're not going to work with you anymore. Yeah. So I was like, oh, man. Oh, so, but that, that poor lender, like, you know, mm-hmm. I put them through so much work for like no return. And so, so did like, you have to switch lenders like real quick? Yeah, well, actually, so, I mean, like, the in the beginning, I was, I was like, going to try to do, like, this kind of hybrid burr strategy. But in, later on, I actually, like, decided to do, like, a full burr. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. not having any money in the beginning, I basically had to borrow the the, the whole money for, like, the down payment, et cetera, of the, the whole process. And so, what I did was, I went to all the banks in, like, my area. So, like, mm. if you go to Alamo, mm. there's, like, five banks, for, like, right, right next to each yeah. other, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Bank of Hawaii, First Wine Bank, et cetera. Yeah. And then I went to all the banks on the first, like one day and mm. I opened up uh, or applied for lines of credit in every single one of them. And so right. you can do this thing called a personal line of credit where they just check your income mm-hmm. and your credit score and they'll give you between ten to $50,000 in a line of credit, right? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And so the the strategy is you apply to all of them on the first and one day because when you're one applying, <laughs> when you're yeah. applying, well, they'll, they'll all pull you separately yeah, yeah, yeah. for the hard pools. But then at the same time, they're, when they ask you like, would you have any other the debts when they pull up your credit report you have no other it debts, no other yeah. debts. Yeah. so then basically I'm like, I went to the one um, there's five banks in one day and then I got, they gave me like 15, 20, 30, 15, 20. I basically had over 100 grand in like lines of credit from these five banks. Yeah. And now I had like access to capital to do my first deal. That's, you know? so, Ooh, good. that's so cool. And super cheap money. Too, yeah. Right? yeah. At the time, it was like Fairly. introductory race, like 3%, 4%. Yeah. So see, the that's higher so ones were like 7 or 8%. Yeah. But then, I mean, still yet, I mean, the for your deals, just having access to the capital is like really huge, right? Yeah. So that's a and big thing. And it's still a form of OPM. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah totally. Yeah. So, okay, so you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then you decide that you're going to go into a virtual market for all those reasons that you said. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you Mm -hmm. from after Mm -hmm. reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad Mm -hmm. to do your first deal? So... I probably started putting in offers like after one month to like, mm-hmm. try and like oh, okay. in, inside of the market, but I mm-hmm. got 
like I said, I got rejected or like the, the things didn't work out. But I think maybe like three months in, I was under contract for my first, the first bird deal. Oh, wow. Dude, that's so quick. cool. So, so you took action almost immediately. Yeah. yeah. How yeah. many offers were you making like a day to land that one? Actually, like, so what I did was I just talked to a whole bunch of wholesalers. Oh, okay. So I was actually trying to get these deals from wholesalers. And okay. so the beauty about these out-of-state markets versus Hawaii is there's a ton of wholesalers. Yeah. And they, when you're a wholesaler, you want more eyes on your property. So they all want to be, want you on your buyer's list, right? So I reached out to some Facebook, like, groups, whatever. It's like, hey, I'm looking for deals. Any wholesalers, can I yeah, add me to your list? Google it. Um, we buy houses, Indianapolis, or mm-hmm. some house fast, Indianapolis. See who shows up over there. Just try to get on as many lists from wholesalers as possible. And then every day I get like 10 different deals sent to my to my inbox as far as like potential deals. And my thing was not trying to like find the deals, just trying to find which one I want to buy. Right. Yeah, so, got dude, it. That's so cool. So you found the wholesalers, right? Mm-hmm. So you found your lead source, mm-hmm. you found your funding source, you got your first deal, and you knew exactly what you were doing, right? Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 100 so, you know, percent I, I actually remember this because like the I was I was in my, my job at the time, right? And so we were at a client's, we were actually we were working for the state and the mm-hmm. clients. And then there was like this room where it's kind of like there's no like reception, the thing, right? But I was, I was trying to go back and forth with my wholesaler because I was trying to close on this deal, right? And yeah. so I'd have to like, in the middle of like me, it's like, oh, sorry guys, I got to step out. So I had to go into the hallway <laughs> with my laptop and just try and like talk to the wholesaler and say, okay, like, can we, what do we need to do here? Yeah. Et cetera, yeah, yeah. So, and then go back to the room and then like, so it was, it was like, it was very like a little bit stressful because I was totally. at my job, right? But trying yeah. to do like, a little bit of real estate. I'm buying my first deal on the side. And the thing was, it was very scary because I knew nothing about the process about buying a house or like rehab or anything. Right. Mm. So the whole idea of buying this house, like thousands of miles away without ever seeing it yourself, but just mm. relying on pictures or other kinds of people to yeah. kind of verify that it's actually there. It was like, like very, very scary in the very so beginning. So how did yeah. you get over that though? So, so I think the best way to get over any fear is just more education. Mm. Okay. And so like the reaching out to like the other people in the, in the space, talking to them and then, then like just talking to people on the phone, you can really kind of get a feel for like referrals, like, okay, who's legit, who's not in the space. And yeah. then calling tele companies. I remember when I was buying this house, it was $70,000. Okay. And then so like wiring the $70,000 to this title company, it was very, very scary because you hear like, once you wire it, you wire it to the wrong place, your money's gone, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> take backs. Exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, oh, what if this is like a scam? Like they have a website, but then anybody can put up a website, right? Totally. So like, how do you know? So I had to like, like they're contacting me through the email, right? Then I had yeah. to I call like separate like emails around or other phones online. Just like I just all this due diligence just to make sure that this title company was like legit before I wired like the funds to them. Yeah, you know? and so, yeah. yeah. But, but that's good. So you're talking about trusting but verifying. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You you didn't just take what you got at face value. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You said, okay, that's the title company we're using, but let me go do some due diligence. Yeah, and yeah. so I, you felt more secure in the process. Yeah. yeah. And the same thing with just a property in general, right? Mm-hmm. Having so having somebody else walk their property like mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. on the bigger pockets forums, just like people are so generous, like, hey, can you help me out when like for like a, you're starting out? Like, hey, what's your thoughts in the area, like, et cetera, et cetera. And mm-hmm. so just from the contacts and just the, the, the rise of the internet, which wasn't available maybe like 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But then, like, you have so much more confidence to, to see, like, or to operate out of state, like, like thousands of miles away, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you bought the deal. You wired that 70K. 70 grand. <laughs> <laughs> and so you started renovating it. How yes. did that process go? How did you find a contractor? All that fun stuff really so, same thing with referrals was we i mean i just talked to different people in the space and i mm-hmm. eventually landed upon a contractor interviewed a few different ones like they recommend right and so yeah. mm-hmm. contractor was like excellent on the phone he's like yeah dude every friday we'll have you pictures and we'll have like all this process <laughs> sounds amazing like, everything you like you yeah every question like you want like, get answered it's yeah. like oh exactly the guy I'm, this is my guy like yeah you know? yeah so, and there's another, there's other contractors who are using i mean other investors who are using him as well right and so uh-huh. like it was like some legitimacy and so right. First week we we started the project, no pictures. No. I was like, hey, hey, can you send me some pictures? Like, yeah, sure. Don't worry, like the I'll get it to you. Yeah. Next week, no, no pictures. No pictures I was again. Like, okay, what's going on over here? Right? <laughs> no so, communication. Like, uh, did I just get like like bamboozled? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But then like so I asked some other buddy, someone else to go and check and just take a look at the project, right? So they mm-hmm. said, No, the project is moving along. Mm-hmm. The contractor is just not the most like um responsive, responsive yeah. or mm-hmm. like responsible kind of person. Like, yeah. you know, so that's a common theme. <laughs> I don't know. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys had some probably experiences with like working with different contractors before. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, just yeah. you know, you you try to get you try to set up all the the 
processes, right? Mm-hmm. You have that clear expectation. Mm-hmm. All the mm-hmm. documents are signed. Mm-hmm. Still doesn't go how it's supposed yeah, you to can go. Do, you can do everything right. And most times a contractor is going to look great yeah. and sound great on mm-hmm. paper. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. and then you get into it and then, you know, yeah. you start to really learn mm-hmm. about. Yeah. You got mm-hmm. boots on the ground to verify that the work was actually happening. Yeah. That was huge. Right. Yeah. Having somebody else like, I mean, just, just because like, I think bigger pockets forums is very huge for me then just to kind of reach out to like the community and just trying to get people there to just actually like be boots on the ground for me. Right. Yeah, and so, totally. But I mean, the project was, it was going, it was going right. Mm-hmm. And so like work was being done and the contractor, he was actually a very, I mean, he did good work. It just, so like he was good work and good price, just not like responsive or yeah. on those, on those ends. Right. And yeah. Then, yeah. So it went good into the very end. And then there was like that last mile, I feel like it's very, sometimes very hard they to teeter mm-hmm. off. Yeah. Just trying to like complete the project. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, for some reason, it's just like that. You get momentum. The momentum and it just, stops. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. At the very end, there's like some things that he needed to finish that he would just like, was super like delayed on it. Mm-hmm. And there's no communication back and forth. And so I had one last draw that I had to give him. Mm-hmm. I was like, Hey, can you get this? Can you finish this? Right. And so like, it just kind of communication kind of stopped or like things weren't happening. And so I was like, I reached out to some other investors in the area and they said like, Hey, we recommend you want to try this guy, um, Todd. He's a project manager in the area. Oh, so nice. he basically manages projects for out of state investors like myself for mm-hmm. a fee. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to like try and reach out to him and see if he could help me out. And mm-hmm. so actually, I had like some conversations about with him, his mm-hmm. business, his business model, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so he actually came to help me on my project and he actually did it for me pro bono, which wow. I don't know why he did that for. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah. super appreciative of that. But he basically just came to like just help me finish that project for me pro bono. And then, like, so he, like, kind of worked with the contractor to kind of get things done. At the end of the day, it ended up, the contractor was dropping the ball. He's like, hey, if you want, I can get my other guy to come in and finish the project for you, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. he actually has, like, a, a small stable of contractors that he works with to help out investors like myself. Yeah. Cool. So then he brought his guy in to basically finish the project, and then I paid his guy the last job. Mm-hmm. But my contract, the, the original contractor was kind of pissed off that, like, he didn't get his last job. You're but, like, right. I was trying to get in contact but, I mean, with you. At the same time, you just, yeah. If, yeah, if you just finished it, it right. like, you would have got the last job. Totally. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So it sounds like you're pretty resourceful and you just reached out when you needed to reach out. You found the context that you needed. To, it's, it's possible. It's hundred percent possible. It just work. Right. Yeah. So like right. a lot of this thing is like, there's nothing difficult about it. It's just, you have to put in the time. Right. So like yeah. now you have to, you actually, you actually have to interview these different contractors. And a lot of people are like, I'll just pick the first one I see. Right. It's too yeah. much effort. Yeah. It takes time and energy. And even like when things go wrong, it's very simple to say like, oh, see, like real estate doesn't work because of this, right? But it's just, you just have to figure it out or keep to keep on going until you find somebody who can help you to figure it out, right? Yeah. Right. I think that's a important tip is, mm-hmm. and I think it's in, it goes across the board in a lot of different spaces, but a lot of the work and the most important work mm-hmm. has to be done up front. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, yeah. you do all of that stuff mm-hmm. up front to guarantee like a more smooth mm-hmm. process. Totally. Yeah. Okay, so you finished the reno. How much was the reno? The renovation was thirty thousand dollars. Okay. And like the prices are, are like ridiculous. For a full gut? Yeah. So it was like <laughs> so my roof, brand new roof, like what? shingles and everything. <laughs> brand new roof for a three one eleven hundred square feet and a new I mean a detached garage. Wow. Hundred percent like reef like replaced fifty five hundred materials and labor. Right? That's insane. That's crazy. Inside and out, like like so basically a full gut for the house. I mean, That's like, like sixteen brand new dollars bathrooms, a square new foot. kitchen, like new, new countertops, the the whatever the works like right, 30, right, right. 30 grand. Like, that's yeah, crazy. That's wild. And that's the benefits of going out of state. Yeah. You know? right. Okay. So what did you do next? So the next thing to do was to find a tenant, right? Yeah. So like you want to start renting it out. So we actually, I mean, actually, um, we reached out to the, the, the community to see like, Hey, who's a good property manager, mm-hmm. et cetera, interviewed the different ones, found one that I liked. And then we got a tenant in place. Mm-hmm. And then like the, that was a whole nother process, right? There's due diligence. And then like the, in the beginning, I was very, like, stickler. I mean, like, I really had my hands in the whole thing. Like, hey, I want to see all applicants. I want to review them myself, mm-hmm. et cetera. Like, right, choose right, who right. I want. Yeah. I found, actually found a really good tenant. And that same tenant is actually there today. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's that awesome. Guy. That's crazy. Yeah. So, like, problem-free. Like, you know, like, it's been, like, it's really good. That's so, amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. But then you get the tenant in place. And then, so, it rented for $1,000. Okay. And then you, the next step is to refinance it, right? So, go to the bank and say, like, hey, I'd like to pull out cash from my property, right? And so... Mm-hmm. Went to some exact same thing, reached out to local community. Hey, there's some lenders you guys recommend, et cetera. And then like that one lender, like I feel, I wish I, I want to use them again, but they hate me, right? <laughs> they so didn't want to like, work with you. That sucks. You're like, <laughs> I actually have a property this time now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then oh, there's, tons, there's tons of like good quality people like in the space. Yeah. Like, you right. know, so I found another really good lender. And so we went through the process and mm-hmm. 
The process to refinance your, your property basically is the, the lender will send their appraiser out to the property, and whatever it appraises for, they'll give you seventy five thousand dollars cash back into you into your bank account, right? Yeah. Right, right. So right. so far, I've used about a hundred thousand dollars for the seventy thousand to purchase mm-hmm. and thirty thousand for like the renovation, mm-hmm. getting about thousand dollars a month in rent, mm-hmm. paying my property manager a hundred dollars in in property management fees, and but then I'm still have I'm still at the hundred thousand that I, that I owe to like these the the lines of credit, right? Right, right. 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 And then so the lend the appraiser goes out and they come back at the appraisal and they said, okay, this house appraises for $70,000. Not and good. I was like, what? what? There's, there's no way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. like that, yeah. right? I mean, like that. Yeah. And so like the, he sent me the comps that he used, right? Mm-hmm. And so like I looked at the comps and then like the, one of the comps he used, it was like $50,000 comp. Mm-hmm. Like it was very similar to mine, but mm-hmm. it was actually on the market right now for $150,000. Oh, oh, wow. So somebody else actually like bought it as a fixer, right? And mm-hmm. then they're trying to They fixed it up and then they're yeah, trying to sell it. Right? Like, dude, right. can't use a pending thing. <laughs> no, no, no. There, so then the comp he used was a, was a, was a bot, was the, the $50,000 one, comp, right? Yeah. Right. From before it was You're fixed like, up. Yeah. So look not at the, the accurate value. Yeah. Look at the condition yeah, of that one. Yeah. Look at the condition and of there mine. Another, there was another one too, just like that, where it was like it was obviously a fixer bought off for me, like mm. seventy grand. Then you look at the pictures now; it was like recently remodeled, right? For like, wow. the, but I don't think it was on the market. But basically, it was the same thing where mm-hmm. the comps he was using was is similar in like the square footage and the value. I mm-hmm. mean, in the from on paper, but when you look at the condition of the when it was bought, it was probably like in terrible condition. Yeah, you know, so. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, okay, like we're probably gonna have to like get another appraiser to kind of come in and try and do a reappraisal and try. So you and get- contested your first appraisal. Yeah. Ever. Nice. <laughs> but the, yeah, and the, that's the beauty about when you like when you're doing the borough strategy, right? Yeah. Because even if like the you don't like the appraisal, you can always get a new new one. It's just gonna take a little bit more effort, right? As, right. right. As long as you have comps to back up what you think it should be, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I thought a reasonable appraisal looking at the comps in the area was like 130 to maybe 135. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that's like mm-hmm. what I kind of expected. Yeah. And so like, I was like, okay, like this, there's no way this guy's going to raise it up to what 130 would I need it. But I'm just going to submit this, this kind of like, um, packet with like the comps explaining like, Hey, look, look the, the comps you're using is mm-hmm. actually in the market now for 150. This other guy, he's on the, he's like, he fixed it up too. Mm-hmm. And here's some other comps I would like you to consider. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I send the packet. And then miracle of miracles, <laughs> the guy like admits he's wrong. He reappraises ah. it for one forty. Oh, wow! So, like, I don't know how double. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? That's wow. so crazy. And That's so wild. Again, I mean, like it's. I'm like I. I was not expecting that, right? Yeah. So like, it's a, It's like a little mini miracle. Like, as a know, home so, run, right yeah. there. That's crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. So at okay. One forty. The bank will let you pull out one hundred five mm-hmm. in like seventy five percent. So then. Yep. About five grand goes to like lender fees or whatever. So I got to pull out a hundred thousand dollars and then pay back my my lines, my of, lines credit. of credit, et cetera, yeah. right? And yeah. so basically full bur is rent my mortgage is like a little over seven hundred. Mm-hmm. I mean the renting for a thousand. And mm-hmm. so first project Home run burr. Home run burr. Full burr. Yeah. yeah. Full That's burr. so cool. So many nuggets in there. So the burr strategy mm-hmm. is basically you can recycle the same amount of funds over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. yeah. If, like you're, the if com- you're doing it right. If yeah. you're doing it that <laughs> yeah. way. Well, if you're doing it right. I, I don't yeah. want to say right because I don't think there's like... I guess you could go real wrong yeah. on a burr, but <laughs> probably it's o- flip it. <laughs> but yeah, but it's okay sometimes to have to leave some of the money in the yeah. deal. Because right? the, the whole goal is cash flow, right? So like yeah. the yeah. alternative would be I just buy a hundred forty thousand dollar property and put twenty percent down, which would be like thirty grand or something. Right. Yep. So if I could like do a burr and like leaving maybe only ten grand, it's mm-hmm. still like a win for me, right? So totally. Like it's a, it's it's just like a, a cheaper or like better way to have like a, a owner rental, and at the very end you've got like a this fixed up rental, so it's gonna be like very low on capital expenditures or maintenance, right. Right? Right. Right. right? right, right. And as far as just like the, I mean, like you choose like your neighborhood or whatever, like you choose where you want it to be, etc. You place a tenant yourself, so you're not inheriting like a bad tenant. Like the whole yeah. process is just very conducive to like, and it's the most like efficient way to like to buy properties, right? Because yeah. let's say I fix and flip that property. If I sold it for 140, mm-hmm. then like after realtor commissions and then like also like paying taxes on the, the capital gains, right? The mm-hmm. short-term capital gains. Mm-hmm. You probably end up with maybe like 15 grand or whatever, right? Yeah. Or 20 grand maybe. But right. I have a hundred or I have 35 grand in equity by just doing the burst strategy, right? right. And so, Right. And like exactly like you guys are saying, I can do this over and over and over, right? Yeah. There's no limit to how many you can do. You just limit it by time, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. that's the only thing you limit it by. Yeah. No, it's a super powerful strategy and you can do it anywhere. I know how it's harder to get burrs, mm-hmm. but it mm-hmm. is possible. All of us have done them yeah. at this table yes. beautifully. Yeah. yeah. So it is possible. But another thing that I think it's important to point out is the fact that a lot of the times you don't know what you don't know when you're first getting started in real estate, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you have to accept like 
that appraisal. Yeah. A lot of people would have thought, oh my gosh, yeah. I have to accept this. Yeah. And then yeah. you could have lost a lot of money or the bird wouldn't have gone how yeah. it was supposed to, right? So, but instead, you don't have to take that circumstance. Mm-hmm. Our job as investors is to solve problems. That yeah. was a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. And instead, you didn't take that. You said, mm-hmm. actually, I did my homework and this is what I think mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and it works in your favor. Does it always happen? No, but you took the the opportunity to try and change your circumstance. Yeah, yeah. And it worked out. And a lot of the times it does work out, but people are scared to mm-hmm. take that step or try to solve that problem. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they just accept that circumstance. And yeah. that's not necessarily the, you don't have to do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 totally. So super successful first burr mm-hmm. and then i know you you went on to do a f- a, a bunch more a right a million more yeah. well, in, i mean in, a indie? few more so like, after that i was like hey it's basically i got the system down like yeah. it's it's cake right i mean like the yeah. i mean so just we did five more that year it mm-hmm. just this the exact same process you know i just buy from a wholesaler one of them are one thing when have been off the mls from a wholesaler i think the wholesaler Bought off the MLS. I mean, he got on the contract from the MLS yeah. and he wholesaled it to me, which nice. but it worked for my numbers. Yeah. Jerry Norton <laughs> strategy. Yeah. It, 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 but it, yeah. it worked for me. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. so totally. just, the power of the bird is you can use the same capital to do it over and over, right? So mm-hmm. like we did five more that year. And then at the end of that year, I was like, this is an awesome strategy. Like $200 a door, $100 a door, et cetera. I just need like a hundred of these, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then I was like, you're limited by like that, hun- that initial hundred that I have access to. Mm-hmm. You're limited by that capital, right? Because like, you can you can keep rolling that hundred over, but then you gotta wait for that thing to finish. One right? at a time. Yeah. One at a so time. So like let's say I had a million, I could do ten at a time, right? Like mm-hmm. theoretically, right? Right. So at the same time that I was um like learning about the birth strategy and like going to forums and everything, like I also was like networking locally here in Hawaii and seeing some of the the guys who are doing it here, like the fix and flippers or like the just the, the general people who are doing like um real estate investing in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. And so my conclusion was like, hey, like Hawaii is not a very good cash flow market on average, right? But as mm-hmm. far as fix and flipping, it's very good because like the ROI on your time in Hawaii is very high, right? Right. So totally. If I could do take the same skill set I'm learning as far as buying houses, cheap, rehabbing them and selling them mm-hmm. or refinance them there in Indianapolis, let's take that same skill set that I'm kind of developing there, bring it to Hawaii, do some fix and flips and then now I have a bigger chunk to kind of do the burr machine inside of Indianapolis like you know yeah totally yeah. but Hawaii is super expensive you can't buy houses here exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I mean that's when I mean like the, when the, when I first started I think it was impossible right but then yeah. then I learned about things like hard money lenders right, right. and then the, also like having a little bit of success in like the burrs and that in Indy gave me like a little bit of credibility and then so when I was like reaching out to say like, hey, I need some partners for like the Hawaii deals or some mm-hmm. like the other deals, people are more willing to like say like, hey, like it looks like you have a little bit of success. Mm-hmm. We'll lend a little bit of money to you. Like, like totally. here's like 50 grand. Here's like, yeah, here's a few grand here and there. And the, now that I have some capital or some like some people who are willing to willing to lend me money. Yeah. Then like now I could actually gap fund basically the deals that I'm trying to do in Hawaii, you know. So, right. Totally. Right, right. Okay. So then you came back home and you started mm-hmm. fixing and flipping. How yeah. did that go? I mean, in the beginning, I think that was probably around the time when we met. Yeah. And like we yeah. were yeah. like, I was like, I had a little bit of success in Indy, but no deals in Hawaii, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, in Hawaii, it was like, honestly, like a huge struggle when I first started. Yeah. Just trying to get that first deal. And mm-hmm. I did, I tried all kinds of marketing. I did like um, direct mail. I did um, PBC. I did um, well, a few other things, right? Just trying to like, trying to do what I could to try and find like an off-market deal, right? Right. So, then in the beginning, and I had like a lot of like near misses where like the we're at main with homeowners and saying like, hey, like this, this, like let's work this, we can work this out. And it seemed like they're on board. They had like their houses were like falling apart, like tear down or whatever, right? And right. So yeah. Then I just had the last minute for some whatever reason it didn't work. And I remember my wife, like, she always comes back to me. She's like, You remember when you first started? You're like, I just won my first deal. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That's just like, I was like, or like, I was like, Oh, I feel so defeated, right? Because yeah. you try so many times and then. You come so close, but then you mm-hmm. you, you fail, right? And right, so right, right. That was like a big struggle when I first started. Yeah. But eventually, keep on trying, and eventually, like we got one, right? So, yeah. how long did it take? I want to say it was like maybe like four months before we got a, a, a first deal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hawaii. Which is which is not a super long time, but no. it is a long time. Four right. months, especially when you're coming from being able to have <laughs> deals handed to yeah. you in yeah. indie, right? Yeah. Like the wholesalers, you're looking at 10 yeah. every mm-hmm. single day, just yeah. choosing which one you want to buy. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now you have to actually do outreach yeah. for these deals Time, and market money, for these deals, effort, right? Yeah. But I think it's a good place to point out that 
it's it was really the consistency and the persistence mm-hmm. that you had. Mm-hmm. I feel like too many times people will start doing it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. give up. Yeah. yeah. And they give up right before yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. Right. So, so how are you able to overcome those all of those of, things? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, uh, how did you push yeah. through that? Yeah. I think like part of it is just like my my natural like I just don't like giving up so mm-hmm. like, I just like kind of just going after it and then usually when I do something I always go after a hundred percent right so yeah. for those four months it wasn't like part time I was like every day of my life I dream and sleep about trying to like so I think like one of the things for me is just like kind of having like a singular focused mindset and I think that's kind of like really defined me my whole life the way this I kind of approach things and so whether it's like in the okay when I was, at one point I was like super into video games I just played video games like 24 <laughs> 7 like whatever right and yeah. I was into like tennis for a little while I just played tennis like 24 7 and then yeah. so we just like when real estate be, kind of became like my like obsession basically mm-hmm. I would just like all day, every day, just thinking about, okay, how can we, what do I need to do to find this deal or whatever, right? And so yeah. just, even like when I dream about it, it's like, generally like my, my wheels are turning and I just like dreaming about real estate, whatever, right? And so yeah. reading and just trying to, trying to like, just kind of go for like a hundred percent. And then I think eventually like it's, you put the, it actually happens, right? And so yeah. those four months of work probably might've been like maybe like two years of like actual, like 40 hours a week because yeah. I'm, I'm grinding like 80 hours or whatever. And like it's yeah. focused. And the thing is like, when you focus on something, it's way more productive than mm-hmm. if you kind of like do like little dabble little, right? here, so, right? The right. super focused forty hours is like a hundred and sixty hours of like yeah, like twenty twenty kind twenty, of. 20 like yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. Totally. Or being distracted, try, trying to multitask. So they yeah. always say that multitasking yeah. is the most ineffective thing you could ever do. Inefficient, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. super sure. inefficient. Yeah. It makes me think about um, Grant Cardone's book. I'm listening to that right now, Ten X, where he talks about how you have to be obsessed with something mm-hmm. in order to really succeed at mm-hmm. it and how society, like if you think of our kids, right? Mm-hmm. When they're obsessed with something like y'all and LOL dolls or Bubba and freaking yeah. Spider-Man, like yeah. they are obsessed, yeah. right? right? Right. How society always teaches them, okay, but that's inconvenient for me as the mom because mm-hmm. you want me to play with LOLs, but I'm trying to do something. Mm-hmm. So it's like we almost deter their obsession. Yeah. And then it goes into adulthood where it's like, no, it's not good to be obsessed. Mm-hmm. But Grant's saying like that's so wrong. It actually mm-hmm. is super good and effective yeah. if you're trying to go after something to be 100% obsessed with it. It's like you have to yeah. because that is the driving force behind. Yeah. And then that person that was so obsessed with that, right, reaches that level of success. Mm-hmm. And then everyone's like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? When the mm-hmm. whole time they were like, oh my gosh, he's crazy. He's yeah. so obsessed with this thing. Yeah. He won't stop talking about it, you know? I think there's like seasons, right? So like, mm-hmm. obviously, like, if you have a family or other have other obligations or things, right? There's like seasons where you can be like obsessed about certain things and mm-hmm. seasons where you can have more balance, right? And so, yeah. But when you're starting out in any kind of business, I think, any kind of solo entrepreneur kind yeah. of things, like it really takes a lot of like obsession to kind of get your rocket off the ground. Right. Yep. So like once your rocket's off the ground, as you guys probably like know, like it's, it's so much easier to when you have momentum, right? Yeah. So like, totally. the deals come easier, the money comes easier, like yep. the connections, everything comes easier once you have the momentum. But that first part of grinding to get mm-hmm. that momentum on the ground, that's like the hardest part for us to, as like investors to kind yeah. of like reach, right? And so, that yeah. obsession is what builds that momentum, mm-hmm. which then leads mm-hmm. to that success. Yeah. So. I feel like, I feel like it's a society thing and I like how Grant brings that up about obsession. It's because not all things are healthy to be obsessed yeah. about. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So when we're, and, and I think we share this, mm-hmm. uh, we all share this, but mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'll speak for me personally. I have a very addictive personality uh-huh. and it's, uh, it's the same thing. Like yeah. I get, I fall in love with skateboarding when I was a little kid. Yeah. I, that's all I did. 24 seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skateboarded, got really, really good at skateboarding <laughs> and then stopped skateboarding yeah. and moved on to the next thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, the key is being able to find that healthy outlet that can mm-hmm. also bring wealth for your family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you're obsessed about that, yeah. dude, you're set. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If it's a healthy obsession, that's going to bring wealth and time mm-hmm. freedom, then scream that from the rooftops. I think so like like you guys are pointing out the vehicle really matters right totally, so like, totally. I, if I was obsessed about like let's say even my job as a software developer like I could have done really well but mm-hmm. I'm very capped at a certain what I can do right so mm-hmm. the vehicle kind of limits to what well, how how high or how successful you can be right? right yeah and so the beauty about real estate is like the cap is so high and the vehicle is so powerful. It's like a mm-hmm. so much reward with so little risk if you put in the right work, right? right yeah. So right. like it's yeah. a 
the the time and effort that we put into like the real estate investing, it's been paid off like a hundred times fold as far as like the our returns, right? Totally. So. And how quickly you can achieve mm-hmm, what you're trying mm-hmm. to go after. Yeah, through that vehicle of real estate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So powerful. So what strategies are you focusing on now? So you did Burr mm-hmm. and you're still doing Burr in mm-hmm. Indy, right? And then you came home, you you didn't physically come home, but you started fixing and flipping in Hawaii. Fixing and flipping and a little bit of burring in Hawaii. Okay. Nice. Whenever the whenever the the property will cash flow the back end, I would love to keep it as a as a rental, right? And mm-hmm. so like whenever that opportunity presents itself, which is not live very often, mm-hmm. then like I would like to keep it. Other than that, then like sell it for a profit and then try and roll that profit into like another investment, et cetera. Can can you tell us why that's the case? I think I feel like a lot of a lot of times like the fix and flippers are like mm-hmm waiting for these big payouts and that's mm-hmm. the sexy part. Um, but yeah. why would you rather like Keep hold it. on to a property? Yeah. yeah then, why then is the bigger it. flex holding on to the property? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, I think people, I think people like say like, I might've been Grand Cardone or something. There's like, there's rich and there's wealthy. Yeah. Right. So the rich people like make a lot of cash, like immediately. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then like it's, you also can spend it or you pay lots in taxes, etc. But then the wealthy is like, it stays in your net worth. So there's like your net worth is basically how much you were worth across like all the your equity in your houses plus your cash, right? Mm-hmm. And plus your cash flow. And so when you own real estate, that's like the, one of the most powerful things as far as building your wealth. Because there's like four things that really happen when we have rental property, right? There's the cash flow, the difference between the rent and the mortgage every month. Mm-hmm. Then there's appreciation. The property is going up in value over time. Mm-hmm. There's a tax benefit. So you get to take like um, phantom, basically like tax breaks, depreciation, some extra mortgage interest, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then there's also like your loans getting paid down by your, your renter, right? right? So mm-hmm. just by owning this rental property, like... Actually, like if you were to do like the metrics on this one rental property that I own in Hawaii, mm-hmm. every year you, you take into account all of those metrics, appreciation, depreciation, my net worth grows by over $100,000 every year by me doing absolutely nothing, nothing. Right, right? right? And so like with the more that you kind of hold like own these rental properties, they're all increasing your net worth slowly. Mm-hmm. But then like, so if you have just one, right? Your net worth goes over, let's say like 20 grand a year. Mm-hmm. Then you, you can put it increase like 10 of them. Now your net worth is going up by 200 grand a year, but you're doing absolutely nothing, right? Yeah, so it's that's such so a cool. way to leverage like and the, the horizontal scaling. Yeah. And Hawaii is a ridiculous place to own and to grow, grow your net worth because of our appreciation. Right. 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 So I mean, like, even if the last year, like the I think the houses are appreciated like hundred grand, two hundred at least. Easy, yeah. Like, at least. Easy. Yeah. yeah. At minimum. Like it's crazy. So I mean you you fix and flip it and you make a quick buck mm-hmm. or you just hold it and then you still have that same profit from the thing because it's just equity trapped in your property, right? Yeah. Right. But then like now you're cash flowing, you're getting depreciation, you're getting appreciation, you're getting mm-hmm. loan paid on all these these magical all these things, things. happening just by owning it, even though like you're not doing any of the work yourself. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think Kamahai's and I's goals this year was to at least keep every third property that mm-hmm. we got. Like if it makes sense, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But- yeah. It has to make sense. And, and we want to ke- keep properties here yeah. on Oahu yeah. just yeah. for that reason. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, because of that, I mean, it's so powerful, mm-hmm. but okay. So you're in Hawaii, you're fixing and flipping, Uh, We do have like a large audience of people that really want to get started. Uh So how the hell are you finding these deals? So for me personally, I mean, like I do just do a lot of marketing. And so when I first started, I did a lot of like um, direct mail and pay-per-click marketing. Like uh, that's when I kind of how I started. Mm -hmm. Also did some like texting and cold cold calling, Mm -hmm. some door knocking, some driving for dollars. So just basically every avenue I could uh, like attack just like off market deals, you know, so I think it was kind of ingrained in me that like there was like the deals in the MLS weren't good and there was only off market deals. That's why I put all my time and energy into the off market deals. Mm-hmm. But actually now that I like the more of the season that I'm, I'm becoming, I'm realizing there actually are deals on the MLS and there's are like agents who are able to like help you to like to find like these different deals, right? You know, yeah. so totally. Yeah. At this point in time, it's basically off the MLS, uh, from agent referrals, from texting, from direct mail from PPC, I mean, from a website, I mean, but the, yeah. I mean, those, I mean, basically every kind of like marketing strategy that we can do. Yeah. The only thing I don't do is just bandit science. Yeah. yeah. Like that, yeah, that, yeah. Personally, that's, all, that's the only thing that I don't do, but in everything else, I'm like, it's, it's fair game. Yeah. So, so you yeah. cast a wide net. Yeah. A very wide net. In Why is it good yeah. to cast a wide net? I mean, we're, we're totally similar. I yeah. feel like we u- yeah. utilize almost all of the same marketing mm-hmm. strategies and 
we um don't do bandit signs anymore we did do bandit signs uh-huh. though we yeah, started with bandit signs we did not see a great roi on them uh-huh. so we don't do them anymore and now it just takes too much work to put yeah. them up yeah. I, I i know that they do work yeah. but yeah. Yeah. i feel yeah. like it's cool when we do do like this omni marketing they call it or mm-hmm. casting like a wide net of different mm-hmm. marketing channels because you uh, a couple of different reasons but one thing is the sellers when they say they get a direct mail piece from yeah, you yeah, right yeah. they're also getting a text message from you yeah, and they're also yeah. getting a cold call from yeah, you yeah. and then when they go online and they say i want to sell daniel my house, wants to buy their house daniel kong's <laughs> website pops up right yeah, so it yeah. adds another layer of credibility yeah um, and comfortability for mm-hmm. these sellers, right? right? Because in the end, they want to do business with somebody that they trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Oftentimes, selling your house, buying your house, those are the biggest things yeah. Yeah. monetarily that you'll ever do in your lifetime. Yeah. Right. So and for that- us, casting a wide net has helped mm-hmm. with that. Um, the other thing is, is Hawaii is like a special market, man. Like, yeah. I feel like we have to do a lot of marketing to... Yeah to find the people that we really need to help. Right. Yeah. But if you're hitting that same person for multiple avenues, maybe they're not a phone person. Maybe they're an internet Mm -hmm. person or, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're not an internet person. They're a male person, you know, but if you're hitting them from so many different avenues, when they are ready to sell, you're the only one that's going to come into their, their mind. Right. Cause they're like, Oh wait, I saw him here. I saw him here. I saw him here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I think like, that's the kind of like, that kind of highlights like the difference between the markets. Like you said, Hawaii is like a special place, but I think any primary market where the price points are very high, Mm -hmm. it's just a different, um, like, like product that we're, we're dealing with. Right. So like in, in Indianapolis, there's tons of deals, but then the products they 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 sell at the very end for one hundred and fifty two hundred thousand dollars, right? Correct. Versus Hawaii, like you can't buy like a a condo for two hundred thousand dollars. Nothing, right? not even a studio. Well, we'll maybe sell. a studio, a, a leasehold in studio. one <laughs> building. Yeah, leasehold. Yeah, but no, yeah, totally. And, and so like the first like in, in in Indianapolis, the struggle for me was just managing the team like miles away. That was probably the hardest part. But in Hawaii, it's just trying to find a deal, right? Yep. And then once you find a deal, like it's obviously you still have the same struggles of trying to manage your contractors and your team. But because the risk slash spread slash profit is so much higher, yeah. you have more margin to kind of play with in things in case things go wrong, right? right. Because, totally. And yep. I think a lot of times this might seem like we're greedy because we ha- we have high profit margins. But the thing is, is you have to consider that it's a profit margin slash risk. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you buy a million, if you're gonna sell a house for a million dollars and you're gonna make twenty thousand dollars. $20,000 by itself seems like it's a lot of money, which it is, right? Mm-hmm. But then in comparison to the things that could go wrong in a million dollar house, yep. that's not enough of a profit or margin for you to go to mm-hmm. go back, right? So like the market dips, it could easily go down to the 850. Yep. Now mm-hmm. you're negative 130 grand, right? Yeah, right. you're and in the so hole. Right. Yep. The exactly. thing is because of the, the the price points, now the the risk slash profit has to be higher. Mm-hmm. And so when it goes well, you're, you're rewarded well. Mm-hmm. When it goes badly, okay, hopefully you just don't lose money, right? Yeah. yeah. Especially yeah. when you were talking about you know your cost to mm-hmm. renovate in India was 30k mm-hmm. for a 1200 square foot house right mm-hmm. I and, and garage and, and garage and garage you know and I mean? everything yeah so yeah. that's like 16 to 20 dollars a square foot give or take in Hawaii we're at 120 dollars yeah. a square foot you know what I mean so like a 20 thousand dollar renovation cost is gonna totally wipe you out in yeah. Hawaii the other thing to note here is that us as real estate investors, especially when we're buying distressed properties, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we're buying properties for what they're worth as they sit. Right. I think yeah. that's a, a misconception that a lot of yeah. people have is that, you know, we're we're going in and we're stealing equity, low-balling, we're t- yeah. low-balling mm-hmm. taking stuff away. But because we're in this kind of a market, there, yeah. the potential for us to add that value yeah. through putting in um, mm-hmm. renovations mm-hmm. is so high that we can buy the properties mm-hmm. for what they're worth as they sit yeah. in a distressed state yeah. and then put in whatever that money is mm-hmm. and, and then reap the reward um, after selling. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, what does your business look like today? What do you, what strategies are you focusing on? So this, I mean, this past few years have honestly been magical. A lot yeah. of it has been very lucky because of the market. And so like, even for like this, this last year we did, like we, we thought like the, the house would sell for that certain point, like mm-hmm. 800,000. Mm-hmm. The market is like ridiculous. It's been climbing up. Plus like the, because I think there's a couple of factors that are like, are playing to this. One is that 
the inventory is so small. Yeah. So it's driving up all the prices, right? But because after you fix and flip a house, now you're like the the prettiest house in like the neighborhood, right? Totally. And so that now that pushes you up even more than you normally would as far as if there was like a bigger inventory, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so because there's a little bit to choose from and then yours is like the one gem inside of the little to choose from, now there's a whole bunch of people who are kind of like basically trying to having a bidding war on your house, right? Right, yeah. right. So, for better or worse, basically, it's it's like a very lucky time to be a, a real, I mean, a flipper. And so yeah. the past couple of years, we made like a very good uh, chunk of change, you know? Mm-hmm. And so right. I think like my, when I, when I first started, it was like the, the baby steps was the burr mm-hmm. in the out of state work, a 20, 30 grand in equity and $200 in cash flow. And I was like super stoked about that. Right. Do the, maybe a few times now that we're in Hawaii, now we're making $200,000 a deal or sometimes even like 400 is ridiculous how much that the the properties are increasing, but it's only that high because the price points are so high, right? So it's very right. easy for a house to go from like 1.3 to 1.4 to even 1.45. Right. But you can't go from like 20 grand to 120 grand to 220, right? Right. It right. doesn't make right. a difference. Right. right. Totally. So because of this past year, I think the next step in our evolution is to continue to fix and flip in Hawaii. But now we're looking to do just do bigger deals and mm-hmm. we're looking to get, actually get into commercial like this year, I think sometime in the very near future. Okay. That's super cool. So what does your your team look like right now? Like what what is your team surrounding you um, to, to help achieve those goals? Yeah. So number one, my amazing wife. Ah, you got to put Christina. her in there. Yeah. She's honest, unreal. To be honest with you, like the if like there's no peace at home or you're, there's any kind of like like stress, you can't focus on your job or doing what you think, you know. So even if it, they're not like no matter what they're doing, if there's not kind of cohesion or you don't mm-hmm. have your wife's not on board or mm-hmm. your spouse, then like you can't focus your energy. Now you're at like 20% capacity because you can't really like do your job, you know? And so right. my totally wife has always agree. been super supportive, very amazing, very patient. And then she chips in with, I mean, our, some of our design stuff. She mm-hmm. even does some like little, some handyman work for for us too. Like, That's you know? awesome. So like my wife has been a rock star for the whole thing. So awesome. number one is, is my wife. Yes. And then we have a few different VAs. We have a VA for some bookkeeping things. We have a VA for some social media mm-hmm. and VAs for some admin stuff. Mm-hmm. And then we have like an admin assistant, which is like similar to a VA, but she's based in America, a little mm-hmm. bit more higher price point. But then she's like a, she kind of is like a jack of all trades where yeah. I can just call the phone and say, like, hey, can you take Handle care of this? this? Yeah. Right, 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 right. So we have an admin assistant and then we just started like a small little intern program where mm-hmm. we've got like four interns where we're, we're, the whole goal of that is just to like kind of give them some experience along the along the journey. Mm-hmm. They can grow, but at the same time, they also are doing work for us. Like, you know, so right. one guy is, he's project managing, basically going to our houses, taking pictures, t- delivering materials, et cetera. Mm-hmm. We have another girl who's helping on the taxes and the bookkeeping side. Nice. We have another guy who's helping with our social media mm-hmm. and another guy, he's kind of like an admin slash helping us to like source deals. And yeah. So that's basically like what our team looks like now. Yeah. That's awesome. And you're doing a, a challenge with them, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. I mean, like the thing is, well, I think it's just as people, we enjoy like giving or like helping other people mm-hmm. in general. Totally. Right? So yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's something weird about it. Like, when they're younger, you feel like more inclined or it's more fun to help younger people than older people. I don't, I, I, no, I don't know why I that 100% is. Yeah. I don't know agree. why. I know. Because yeah. yeah. they have so much potential yeah. still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, they're impressionable. They're 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 moldable too, mm-hmm. I think. And then well, yeah, they're not stuck in a certain way of thinking mm-hmm. or feeling or like no, we have to do it this way, mm-hmm. and it's easier for them to adapt new ways of mm-hmm. thinking because yeah, totally. they don't know anything else. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think I really enjoy just like helping them in their journey of financial freedom and trying to get them like open their eyes to what's possible and then kind of give them the tools that they're going to need yeah. in this journey. And some yeah. of the tools are very practical as far as like okay, this is like what you need to do to to analyze a deal, right? This is what you need to say to talk to a realtor. But a lot of the tools that like I'm kind of finding that they're lacking or they, they need more help on is like staying consistent and motivated, right? The things mm-hmm. like that, like you don't really think is important as an investor. You just think like, the the to do those or like the the weed stuff is important, but the mindset and like the the motivation, the self to stay motivated and consistent over a long period of time is so important as an investor to kind of really be successful. Like you know, yeah. I feel like that's even more important than mm-hmm. the deals and the money and the mm-hmm. sexy stuff. Mm-hmm. It's it starts there, and you just had a, a line. Yeah, I mean, morning. you have to have that right in order mm-hmm. to get all of the other stuff, yeah. and it, in or in order to do it well, mm-hmm. um, the mindset has to be right. The other thing is the mindset is it's something that has to be consistently worked on as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, day it's in, not something. Day out. Yeah. You don't, you don't just. Set it okay. Day, I'm right? perfect. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. I got the mindset. I'm going to be successful. It's like, <laughs> it's a constant. It's a muscle you got to develop. Right? Exactly. Totally. You yep. think of like Steph Curry, right? Like Steph mm. Curry is an amazing shooter, like yeah. in, the, in the NBA, right? Yeah. 
but he practices every day. So if he's so good, why does he still practice, right? Mm-hmm. And he's probably even Kobe Bryant, right? When Kobe he was shooting Bryant, yep. thousand shots a day, right? Yeah. Even after he was that good, right? Why does he still practice? So even if you have the most amazing mindset, you still have to practice. You mm-hmm. still have to. Have, it's helpful to have a coach or read books or get totally. around other people, etc. And so like, yeah. it's so important, like you guys are saying, to constantly keep on like working on it, improving, and trying to take it to like the mm-hmm. developing your muscle of like your mindset, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I figured out. I I now know why you like to work with the the younger kids because, and I I just realized this okay. it's because we wish we got into oh this like God. twenty yeah. years when ago. I, was I mean, dude, can you imagine like where I mean, we would be sitting? We wouldn't be. I don't know. I, we, dude, we would be I, on a if yacht. I got into this like <laughs> seven years ago. Seven years, yeah, like, not even be, seven yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah. I know. It's so wild. I know. No, it's true because you can you know that you are in like inspiring and ingraining such life changing principles into them that when they are our age or mm-hmm. older, like the impact that they can have and the life mm-hmm. that they can have, like, dude, so that's honorable that you're doing that with them. And I hope it was actually like, I can't take credit for it. It wasn't my idea. It was actually a, we hired like a social media manager. Wakale. She's awesome. Uh, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out but to I think, I might, I think I might know who that is. I, yeah. A little bit. I don't know. But, the, yeah. but she was her idea to kind of like document the journey and kind of yeah. like see, see what's going on. And exactly like after she suggested it, I was like, Oh, that's a really great idea. Yeah. And so, the whole thought is like, okay, we can document it with a few people, but then like now when it's on social media or public, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a little mini track record to help inspire or to educate people who are also coming up, right? Yeah. They can just see it mm-hmm. and then they can like kind of follow the same path and hopefully find like get the yeah. same lessons that we're kind of teaching our interns. It's like know? showing them tangible steps with real life experience, mm-hmm. you know, and they're like watching it unfold. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, if this kid can do it, yeah. I can do it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, because I think a lot of times people see us when we're already successful. Right. And they think like, oh, like I can never be like common high interest and like they're already like so successful mm-hmm. but right. they didn't they don't literally know that like you're like two years ago you were not successful right, right. We were crying right, right, right. yeah and it, it feel, i feel like it to a lot of people it seems unattainable right yeah. so like yeah. our we're trying to make it attainable mm-hmm. yeah um and yeah well i think that's our responsibility though as local investors to paint the full mm-hmm. picture mm-hmm. that and to share the struggle as well as the triumph so people yeah. don't just see oh look they're just killing it day in and day out when it's like actually yesterday was a really bad day it could have been like a twenty thousand dollar loss day you know what i mean mm-hmm. not just share the the gains but also mm-hmm. share the losses yeah yeah totally so all the experienced investors share your bad days too. <laughs> yes not just the highlight reels we live in a society where that's yeah. praised it's so much yeah. and glamorized yeah. right and social media can actually mm-hmm. Give you a Cause. false sense of like right, right, what's right. actually reality. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Well, and then they also give a false sense of um, how investing is, how quick it happens, the money that comes and it's like, no, it doesn't happen quick. It takes years of momentum, it years all, of like, It all you comes know. back to hard work. Like, <laughs> and <laughs> mindset, it, we gotta and work. Mindset. Like, yeah. you have yeah. to work at it if you wanna be any type of successful. But, okay, so you told us about your first deal. Kit, let's talk about your last deal. Yeah, the, the last, last deal, deal you did. did. Like, breakdown. See, so the last deal we did was we, it was a pay-per-click lead. Did it have a cat in it? Yes, <laughs> it did actually. It had a cat in it. And I know so, that house. I know. So we, I mean, basically we, the homeowners are looking to sell their house, right? Uh-huh. And so like the biggest thing is like, honestly, we go on like a lot of appointments every day, right? As far mm-hmm. as, or not every day, but like often. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the like, people are looking to sell their house. Mm-hmm. And like nine times out of 10, it doesn't make sense for us to buy the house because mm-hmm. it always makes sense for them to go with like a realtor, right? So like we're giving out like realtor referrals like left and right because like it's, if they have the time and the money to either fix it up or wait and let it sit in the market, mm-hmm. and there's no rush, then like it always makes sense for them to just list it with the realtor, right? So yeah. there's very few cases where we actually end up buying the house, maybe like one out of 10 as far as like yeah. the kind of yep. appointments that we go yeah. on, right? Totally. So, so this particular appointment, like we we reached out, the homeowners reached out to us. We went to go take a look at the property. They were talking to like a couple other investors and to like a realtor at the same time, trying to like figure out what their options are, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And so we we met with them, kind of showed them like, hey, this is what we can do. This is basically like working back with our numbers. And so I think at the time, this was like, so when you're looking at the comps, you're looking at like six from today from to six months before, right? right. So the comps maybe like six months before that date was, we were thinking maybe it was like seven fifty to $800,000 that we could sell this house for, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fixed up, right? You work backwards, your numbers of, let's say like your realtor costs, your holding costs, your... um 
your fixing, I mean, your renovation costs, yeah. right? And your purchase costs, all these different kinds of costs. I think a lot of times when you look at TV shows, they don't include like the holding costs or the realtor right. costs. No. Money costs. They don't include anything. any yeah, of that. They're like things, right? purchase price, renovation, profit. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. So a lot of times it seems like there's a big profit margin, but in yeah. reality, this is what it is to just have like a bare minimum profit, right? Yeah. And plus, right. plus a little bit of risk involved mm-hmm. with that too, right? And so... For this one, we, I mean, we thought like, okay, 750 is a conservative kind of like number. We think we can push it to 800, but there's no guarantee, right? So mm-hmm. in order for us to make like the, our profit or risk in here, mm-hmm. we need to buy like basically a 500, right? Because that's, right. that's even so like, we think like 750 to 800 and you have to buy the 500. Still. S- but then like slim. after yeah. the renovation, like 100, 150 yeah. grand renovation, right? Yeah. Then you got like your holding costs, maybe another 50 grand. Yeah. Your retail costs, another 50 grand. Mm-hmm. Plus like your purchase costs, you're paying closing costs and like mm-hmm. those. Sometimes you're paying all the buyer's closing costs, right? So yeah. there's some taxes right. involved there. Yeah. Right. It could be another 10 or 20 grand. Insurance, staging, all that and stuff. And it's very easy. Like, it always seems like the market could at any time drop just because, like, we're in such a crazy kind of, like, rise, right? Mm-hmm. And right. So mm-hmm. we, our number came as, like, hey, like, the if you want the quick and easy, 500 is probably what we can do. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and so the, mm-hmm. the after, like, just kind of looking at their options, like, they said, okay, like, we want to go with you guys, right? And mm-hmm. so... We basically picked up the house for for five hundred. Okay. okay. And then we just put in like a the the renovations. I mean, like the there's like some challenges on the renovations, like always, like you know, like right. The, right. trying yeah. to figure out what to do, what not to do. Like, the, should we open up the walls? Should we put in a new this or that? Yeah. Right? Or should we like leave it as is? Mm-hmm. And so we kind of kind of went through the process of trying to like figure out what the best strategy was and. I wanted to leave it as is and just do like a quick renovation and then and then and sell the market because holding costs, right? Yeah. Right, right. I was scared if the market tanks, right? Like now the 750 could go to like seven or something, right? Like mm-hmm. you never know, right? Mm-hmm. And so the, the quicker you're in and out, the less your risk, right? As far right. as like, and so, but then my wife was like, no, we're taking down this wall and we're going to make it like a beautiful house, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> But then, so like happy wife, happy life. Like I said, like you know, and so happy wife, happy life. Oh, thanks. But it's so, on like, record. And so like my my wife, she has like an amazing like like taste yeah, and stuff, like, yeah. you know. And so like when she was like, hey, I think we should do this. Like mm-hmm. she wanted like let's do black stainless like appliances. Like no, because everybody else is doing like stainless steel, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So then I was like, no, like let's stick to the like the tried and true. Why are we going to try something different, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. I was like mm-hmm. let's do like our our basic gray subway. Mm-hmm. Um, backsplash that we did for all our other projects, right? Yeah, so, yeah. No, I want to have the counters like the yeah. counters in the back, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. No, and then the tiles, like, let's do the our standard yeah. like one by two tiles. We're like, no, I want to have like the two by two tiles. <laughs> so I was like, man, like, but I was like, I really think it's not good, but I'm like, you're the designer, right? Yeah, so like, let's yeah. go with whatever you think. I've is best, seen it; you know? it turned out great. Yeah. And, in retrospect, I'm so happy with the choices. Like, yeah, you know, like yeah. It, it looks good. Sometimes it's hard to see, like, without, mm-hmm. like, I mean, like the because you still imagine it, right? But the thing is, like, if it's always been working, why change it? That was kind of like my no, thought true. process. No, yeah. totally, totally. It's a balancing act with yeah. flipping, you know. So yeah. I mean, but but it turned out like really like gorgeous after my wife's like things a little bit over budget, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then also like the benefit of that was it took longer than expected, mm-hmm. but the market has been rising with that. So we actually got a lot of equity by just staying longer on the market. And yep. so like it's kind of crazy just the, the crazy market that we're in. Yeah. And then now that we have like the the nice house that before it would just been like a basic house, right? If I did it quickly. Right. So now that we have like a really nice house and then we're like the bell of the ball, right? We're like the yeah. yeah. We have Cinderella. a lot of a lot of offers and they're all competing right and so it's basically creating like this small little bidding war and which is it's really sad because we want to keep prices low if we can right because right. we live in Hawaii right. right but the reality is that like a lot of it is driven by the market and mm-hmm. stuff and, too. and then and then the reality also is that we want to provide like the best product for this family, right? So yeah. whoever is going to move inside here is going to have like an excellent, enjoyable experience. And a lot of times we're as fix and flippers, we're taking properties that are off market that nobody's living in. They're vacant, they're burned down or whatever. Right. We're yeah. adding new family like, homes into the market where a nice family can live. Like, right. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Totally. But I mean, so that ended up being like a miracle, like um, run in the market. And so we're actually under contract right now for a 955. Wow. Nice. That's so, amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So you've had such a cool journey, you know, from that your evolution from mm-hmm. out of state buying, then coming to Hawaii, fixing and flipping, also holding on to properties and mm-hmm. um, through your journey so far. What has your biggest challenge been that you've had to overcome? You know, I think like, I'm trying to think what this would be. Honestly, like my journey, like from, uh, has been like magical. Like yeah. I've had very little, like, like lost L's. I think, I think mm-hmm. part of it is just because I've been, I'm just naturally conservative mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. like my, and running my numbers. And so I think maybe the struggle is like, 
I'm like sometimes I, I think I miss out on deals because I'm just over conservative. Yeah. And I don't really put myself into a bad position because I'm like more conservative, you know? Yeah. 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 But I think maybe like the biggest struggle is just just finding that first deal. I think like it was just like that grind to kind of like to kind of break into the market and actually find that first deal. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of like appointments or like contracts that were signed that were not executed or like yeah. were almost signed that like just like the so much disappointments when you're trying to like just kind of get started and a lot of times i didn't have the tools i think i needed to be able to become come across as credible or to know what to say or how to answer mm. questions for homeowners etc right right and right. i didn't have the network to kind of draw into like hey can you help me with this i, I don't know how to figure this out right and so yeah. i was kind of like learning the job youtube university and so i made some mistakes as far as like the way to handle this, different situations but mm. i think that first probably four months is probably like the of in breaking into hawaii is probably like my biggest like struggle i think yeah no, totally. i no, and i love that because you've heard it here first, Daniel Kong did struggle <laughs> before he started crushing it. Um, but no, I mean, we talked about it. I mean, I feel like that's something that holds so many people back. Like, I feel I feel like way too many times people give up right before they're going to see that success. I don't love that you struggled, but I love that you struggled. Well, and then you got a deal mm-hmm. and momentum like literally yeah. kicks in and yeah. it's so crazy. We talk about like yeah. the momentum side of yeah. things yeah. and how after the first deal, it yeah. just seems to be a lot yeah. easier yeah. Yeah. to find yeah. other ones, yeah. you know, well, after yeah, that. You have proof of concept, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, I went through this. I know mm-hmm. I got to do A, B and C mm-hmm. again. Okay. D got thrown in there, you know, but yeah. now I can do E, you know, yeah. so it's just yeah. proof of concept. So now flip that. What was your biggest victory or your biggest triumph Mm -hmm. in your journey so far? I think the biggest one would probably be our live in Burr. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I would agree. That's a unicorn (laughs) unicorn deal. That's an amazing deal. Love it. Like amazing. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the similar to like all of our, like, I feel like the similar to the last deal, right? It basically the exact same thing played out. Like we got Mm -hmm. reached out to by the homeowner and then they're in some distress, like the, um, some some financial problems, whatever, like mm-hmm. foreclosure, et cetera. And then, so we basically, like, we were one of their options. They were talking to other investors and yeah. other realtors. And for whatever reason, like, we kind of gave them, like, a creative offer, actually, in this one, where this this thing called Subject 2, mm-hmm. where you can, like, take over someone's mortgage and purchase their house. We actually purchased a Sub 2 from them, and it's part seller finance. Mm-hmm. The seller finance was basically the, we put it, we wrap it into the end when we were actually going to sell the house. So it was actually originally a fix and flip. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then uh, during the during the process with the renovations, et cetera, we looked at the cash flow of it, and it's actually like a very high cash flow thing. Yeah. And so they can actually this might make sense to keep as like a, a rental if we could, like you know. And so we ended up finishing the renovation, and then at the same time, the market was going up at the same Appreciating time. So like market, it's a, right. Honestly, our Airbnb in the beginning was like a million dollars. I mm-hmm. think like we had an appraise like after like one point, close to one point two. Wow. Nice. And so it's just, but it's just the market, right? Like yeah. none, none of, nothing yeah. that we we like yeah. earn or deserve. It's just the the yeah. beauty of only real estate, right? Right, yes. right, right. In Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> and so like so after basically we were able to refinance out our our purchase and our um our renovation costs. Plus pay off the 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 seller finance portion of it, mm-hmm. right. take away a little bit of cash, mm-hmm. and then now it's cash flowing at about like four grand a month. So nice. Yeah. Bananas. Yeah, yeah. So it's cool. So good. Yeah. So those would, are the ones we like to keep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially when we can rent them out multiple times. Yeah. yeah so that was the key, key, right? Is yeah. like you could rent that one property out several times yeah. to then maximize your cash flow yeah. to be that dollar amount. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. Think, I mean, that's the only way you can like, really cash flow in Hawaii, in Hawaii. is it has to be yeah. like multiple units or Airbnb. I yeah, think. Totally. So, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's really hard otherwise. Okay, so now, if you could go back to the beginning, mm-hmm. what would you do differently? Or, if or, anything. Yeah, or would would you do anything differently? Yeah. So you're talking about the three years ago journey, Just right? Just yeah, 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 you're fresh. Yeah. Number, Baby number investor. Number one, I would give you guys a call earlier. <laughs> <laughs> we would do that too. I know, I know. <laughs> From the beginning. That's so funny. But I think, so it's like, it's good and bad, right? When I was first starting, I did everything by myself. I self-educated, mm-hmm. I learned. I think there's a lot of growth and muscle that, that developed during that time. But then as I like kind of went on my journey, I started to network more and see, just realize the power of relationships and how other people can kind of help you along on your journey. 
And so, like, I, I'm kind of, like, torn because it, there was so much growth doing it by myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the same time, there was so much growth being around a community or other people. I think it would probably accelerate my growth faster. Right. So I think maybe, like, if anything, it would be just to reach out to other investors and try and see how we can help each other out, like, earlier in the process. And, like, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. So cool. Networking has definitely changed the momentum of our business mm -hmm. and partnerships and it just makes it a lot more fun. Dude, exactly. it's fun. Yeah. It makes it super fun. Yeah. Like <laughs> well, and attainable. Like you yeah. don't feel alone and being in an alone place, it can mm -hmm. be dark, right? And you mm -hmm. get in your head and that's where that mindset thing you have to work ten times harder at it. Yeah. I think another thing too is like what's normal to you, right? So mm -hmm. like when I first started, like all I thought like compared to like my friends and my family like okay I, everybody else has jobs right yeah. like that so i'm doing like average or like even better than some of my friends or family just based on what i've got going on there right right but then when i started like listening to bigger pockets and like talking to people in the forums the normal was okay everybody's doing birds everybody's getting cash flow mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. that's normal for me right right, right. but then it wasn't around like the fix and flippers yet and then yeah. then i but then so okay i actually i reached the normal of the the forums the and bigger pockets yeah. right then I met the the local fix and flippers here, like Corey, Richie, yeah. these guys. Yep, yep. And like normal was okay. Six figure deals and like just crushing it in Hawaii, right? Totally. And that's just normal, right? Mm -hmm. right. So then slowly mm -hmm. you just you get around those guys enough, then just your your normal just kind of like goes up to this level, right? And yeah. so yeah. As it should be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just it's and it's, it's like that in anything in life, right? So like, even like the to politicize it, right? Like the left wing and right wing. If you mm -hmm. hang around all left wing people, you'll think you like left wing. If you hang totally. around all right wing people, mm -hmm. you'll be right wing. Just because like, you kind of like normalize to whatever your thing your your environment is, right? Yes. Right. Yes. And so even now, like we're actually hanging out with some guys who are doing commercial deals. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe like if you talked to me three months ago, I'd be like, no, commercial is too risky, too scary. But totally. some people who are doing it now, I just normalize it for me. So now I'm like, okay, that's just normal. Like mm -hmm. now my normal is slowly like slide right into like to this next level. And I yeah. think the more that you can, can normalize to like a, something where you want to be, the faster you can kind of get there, you know? Yeah. Totally. It's, it's literally putting yourself putting yourself in those rooms mm -hmm. with those people, yeah. which yeah. is super important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rubbing elbows with people that are doing bigger and, and more expensive, more profitable, mm -hmm. just growing in all levels. Mm -hmm. You want to constantly be leveling up in life because if you're not, geez, you're stagnant and you're yeah. basically dying. Like yeah. that's yeah. not a fun place to be. Yeah. So it's like, it's our mission to constantly be yeah. climbing that ladder. Right. Because mm -hmm. then you can, once the information that you learn up here, you can share down here and help those it's people. It's super healthy. And I yeah. think like there's, I think like I went to like a church service one time and they're talking about like the different rivers. Right. So there's like the Jordan river where mm -hmm. it flows and it's so like full of life, the banks and everything. Yeah. Right. Then you've got like, I think the, the other river where it's like, it's just like a stagnant, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the river comes in, but it never leaves, it leaves right? Yeah. Right, right, right. So then I think as investors or like people in general, like whenever we're going to the, the other levels, people are always like giving us, giving, like we're yeah. taking, there's so much we're getting. Mm -hmm. If we just hold it to ourselves, we start to become stagnant, right? Yeah. Right. Whenever you can pass it on to the next people below you, that it's just, that's how you really be like, and teaching helps you to, to retain the knowledge better. Totally. Yeah. You, you think so many insights, benefits. It solidifies it's, the knowledge that you you yeah. have, right? You're like, oh, I actually do know that. Yeah, I do know what yeah. I'm talking about. And sometimes I find out when I'm trying to explain something, I actually help myself understand it better because right. in yeah. order to explain it, you have to like, okay, wait, I don't understand this, but okay, now you, as you're talking through it, you you kind of like figure out oh, this is why it is, whatever. Totally. That or it gives you the ability to actually realize that you might not know that one particular thing. Yeah, then you like, go back and then you figure it out. So yeah, it, you're yeah. learning as you're teaching, right? Yeah. yeah. Which yeah, is so yeah. cool. So to sum it all up, what is the impact that you want to leave with the audience listening? That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. I think okay. the, the biggest thing I, I would like to leave is just to inspire people who are kind of coming up in the journey and mm -hmm. just realize like what is possible. And like the, I think it's very good to have like a, to know how hard it's going to be because if you think it's going to be easy, you're not going to be prepared for the journey. Mm -hmm. But I want them to know that like, Hey, it's very possible. It's going to be very hard but at the end of the heart is also going to come the reward. Like, you know, and so all of us that like, we're now that we're doing very well, it didn't start out this well. It took a lot of like hard work and some years of effort to really grind and put it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then uh, if anybody who's willing to put in the effort and willing to put in the focus and the energy and consistency over the period of time that it takes to hit that momentum, that is any, like the real estate is attainable for anybody. You yeah. don't gotta totally. be like a uh, LeBron James. You don't have to be like super smart. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a rich friend. There's mm -hmm. nothing any single person in America can basically become like from zero to like a millionaire. Like, you mm -hmm. know, and that's like yep. the beauty of America. There's so yeah. much opportunity that we're afforded yeah. living in this country. Like, totally. You know, so. Yeah. 
I love that. Anybody can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Resonate with that. So where can people find you? You can find me on TikTok. <laughs> nah, I mean, okay. I mean, What's your TikTok? <laughs> Dude, I mean, uh, it's, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Uh, Daniel Kong 808. Love Daniel it. Kong 808. Well, thank you. Yeah, right on. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. And um, very much so see many more deals in the future happening. Totally. But yeah, thanks for coming on. We appreciate you. you and Peace. aloha. Thank you. Thank you.